Hey everyone and welcome back. Uh, hope you're all glad to be here. As you can see, I've changed my camera angle ever so slightly because I've gone ahead and switched up my desk setup. It's actually looking decently clean now. May have to go ahead and show that off in a future video. But as you can see, we are getting pretty close to the end of this systems design concept series. And so right now I'm currently looking at the light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, besides this, I've got a couple of short rant videos I wanna make and then a couple of collaborations, and then soon we're gonna be on to those interview questions. So, hope you guys are looking forward to it. Let's start talking about caching. Okay, so as I previously mentioned, today we would be talking about caching. So if you remember from your operating systems class, here is effectively what a CPU looks like. We've got all of our cores over here. As you can see, this would be a two core CPU. And then we've got a few layers of cache until eventually we reach memory, and then finally we get to our slowest form of storage, which is going to be disk. Now for something like a CPU, again, the whole point is we have this hierarchy of cache. And cache enables us to do a lot of things. But the biggest thing it's gonna enable us to do is do faster reads and faster writes, and possibly even shield some accesses to slower forms of data like memory and disk. And in distributed systems, we basically are doing the same thing. So let's go talk about some actual benefits of caching in distributed systems specifically as I resize my screen. So number one is that typically your reads and writes should be faster when using a cache. The reason being that you're probably going to be using a faster form of storage. So in this case, we've got memory, which we'll probably be using as opposed to disk. Additionally, we might end up saving ourselves quite a few network calls. So as you can see, that would be over here where we would reach out to our server, which may have an actual cache built into the actual computer itself. And as a result, we wouldn't have to reach out to the DB, again, thus saving us some time. And then finally, another nice thing about caching potentially is that we can place the cache physically closer to our client, thus saving us time because you know the internet packets have to travel less distance. Additionally, caching can also help us reduce our load on certain key components. So for example, over here, if we have one single database node and a lot of different clients that are trying to reach out to it, if all of those clients are asking for the same piece of data, for example, if they all want to see their home feed and all of their home feeds are the same, having one single larger caching layer, which can answer most of those requests, is going to allow our database to do more important computations that are unique. So I've gone over the benefits of caching, but of course, just like everything else in systems design, there are trade-offs. And so what are the drawbacks that we experience? Well, for one, cache misses are super expensive. They're going to slow us down quite considerably. So as you can see, we've got a client over here. Not only is this cache miss physically going to have to make a network call to get to the cache, but also depending on the type of actual implementation that we use for our cache storage, actually searching for a key within the cache could be linear time, it could be logarithmic time. Ideally, it would be constant time, but that's not always the case. And so then only after we miss in our cache will we go ahead and reach out to the database, thus wasting time. Another thing is that data consistency is complex. Mainly, for example, if we've got two clients and they're both trying to read from their respective cache, these caches might have different values. And this is, of course, a problem that we've seen all throughout distributed systems. For example, when we have multiple different replicas of the database, we often have to deal with stale data, and that can be problematic. Now, of course, this does depend on how much you care. If, again, you're like, fine, I'm okay with eventual consistency, I'm okay with stale data, or possibly even incorrect data, then, of course, caching is not going to be as detrimental to your system. But either way, it does still add quite a bit of complexity. Okay. So the next question that we're actually gonna quickly attempt to answer is what do we cache? And this one should be pretty simple if you started to think about it, but the gist is any form of computation or anything that could be remotely expensive to do or load or read. So that could be database results. You know, if we have a big query to a table and we know that we're gonna be reusing that many times over, that would be great to cache. Another thing is computations done by application servers. For example, sometimes a database can give you partial results, but you either want to merge that with some other results that you have, perform some subsequent computations, or anything like that. And so actually performing uh, a caching of the results of what was on the server can be very useful as well. And then also just like popular static content. That could be images, it could be web page files, anything like that. We're going to devote an entire video to that topic alone when we talk about CDNs. Okay. 
So now I'm going to dub a term called server local caching because now that we've answered the question what do we cache, we should probably start talking about where do we store it. So one type of kind of storing uh, this data I would call server local, just made it up so you know don't quote me on that, don't use it in a systems design interview, but the point is the data that you're caching can actually be stored on the application servers themselves. And when I say application server, that could mean many different types of things. It could be a database, like this guy over here. It could be a message broker, if you're reading the same message over and over and over again, for example, in Kafka. It could also be on your application servers or Zookeeper, your coordination service, anything like that. So what would be an example of this? Let's imagine we're looking at Tinder over here. And I, like the dirty dog that I am, keep going back to my page to check who's liked me. Well, I'm going to probably run that query pretty often, and it's probably not going to be updating very often, right? It's probably infrequent that I get likes, as many of them as I do have because I'm a handsome devil. They don't come in that frequently. So as a result, if I'm checking them every single five minutes, they're mostly going to stay the same. So rather than having to reach out to the database and do an extra network call, what we can actually do instead is go ahead and just get it right from the application server after it's been returned for the first time. And so you may notice here that when we have multiple application servers, it's very important that I am going to be reaching out to the same application server every single time. Now we've spoken about consistent hashing in the past in this series, but this is also something that's very important in load balancing. If I'm a client and I'm gonna reach out to one of my application servers, it's very important that I'm going to the same server every single time, specifically so that I can reach the server that has actually cached the data specific to me. That is why something like consistent hashing, it seems I already wrote it out, so that was kind of redundant, but the point is, if you recall, it's basically a ring that splits up all of the traffic and you know it tells you where you're going to be routed to. The reason being that uh, consistent hashing as opposed to just like random routing is going to maximize our cache hits. You can watch the consistent hashing video if uh, you're a little unclear on how that might work. But let's actually quickly, before I move on to the next uh, picture, go into some pros and cons. The pros of doing server local caching or you know just keeping your cache local to the application server is there are fewer network calls. Like I mentioned, you're already gonna be hitting this thing anyway, so you may as well check the cache. That makes it faster. But on the other hand, well, if this guy were to go down, that cache for me is gone. And additionally, let's say we wanted even more caches because not only do we wanna cache you know, all the people who've liked me, but we also wanna cache, let's say, uh, all of their photos and, and certain other information about them. So it turns out we need more cache storage than we thought. Well, the issue in this case is that we're limited by basically the number of application servers that we have because that's where we're storing the data. But it would be nice if we could scale that cache independently, which leads us to our second possible implementation of caching, which is using a global caching layer. So as you can see, that caching layer would be this guy right here. And when you hit an application server, it could potentially reach out to any of those caches, which is good because it means that you don't necessarily have to rely on consistent hashing as much to hit a certain application server. It might mean that I could hit any of these, but technically, if you know my data was only stored on one of these nodes, then we would probably need a second load balancer right here to make sure that we were hitting that particular cache. Anyways, let's quickly talk about the pros and cons of something like this. The biggest pro, of course, is going to be that we can scale it as we need. We're not basically locked down based on the number of application servers that we have. This layer can scale on its own. The biggest con, of course, is that basically our cache is no longer local to the application server. So now we have to make an extra network call in order to access that data, which could definitely be expensive. Additionally, we now just have more moving parts in our system, which means more things can fail. We have to think about fault tolerance a little bit more. And of course, practically speaking, sometimes that is not very good. So let's quickly do a conclusion so that I can go ahead and go to sleep. But basically, caches are going to seriously allow us to get much better latencies within both of our reads and our writes. The reason being that typically they'll use a faster form of storage than the kind of naive disk implementation that we use with our databases. Additionally, we can put them literally just closer to us and that helps a lot speed things up because, you know, just less distance for those packets to travel like I mentioned before. 
Another thing is that we can effectively establish a wall in front of other components that are a bit more performance critical. If I'm making the same request 10 times over, there's no reason the database has to answer it 10 times over because it's going to reperform a bunch of computations. But at the same time, introducing a cache to our system has some caveats. Of course, cache misses are really bad, and also we may have some data consistency issues if it's important to us. If, for example, I, you know, one cache knows what my password is, but I go ahead and change my password, and the cache doesn't realize that, and I keep entering my change password, and the, the cache is saying that's wrong, that's going to be a problem. So it is sometimes very important that we need to basically make sure that our caches have good data consistency, and that in and of itself is going to take a full video. So, of course, that means that the next videos that we're going to be looking at are going to be cache writes and cache eviction policies. So I hope you guys are looking forward to those because I will be posting them soon. Anyways, guys, have a great night. Looking forward to the next ones, and uh, keep slaying.